All right. Well, greetings from Port Canaveral, and uh, we're so glad to be with you today. And I trust that uh, you have a sense of God working and leading in your life. Today uh, in Port Canaveral, it is just another beautiful day. That's one of the things about the end of February, early March is just spectacular weather. <clears throat> but for me, it does have a, a challenge in that uh, sometimes my allergies get the best of me. So anyway, I trust that you're doing well. And, uh, and today, I just want to encourage you that as you take time to participate with us in this uh, chapel service, that uh, this is an opportunity to really reflect on, on what is God saying in his word. And, uh, and today we have an awesome opportunity to hear from Christina again from India and her friend as they lead us in music. And so what a, what a blessing. If you're uh, interested in providing us a song, I can't promise that we'll use it, but uh, if you want to uh, send it to info at cpm.life, then uh, we will definitely, uh, we'd, we'd love to use it. It's just a question of, uh, you know, every all the logistics. But uh, send us a, a, a video and, and we'll, we'll definitely uh, review it. Uh, so let's get started. I'm going to pray and then we'll have the, the song. And then Josh is going to lead us as, as we continue looking at uh, the story of Hannah and, uh, and Samuel. So, Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to, to worship you in music and in uh, looking into your word. We thank you that your Holy Spirit is our, our guide, our coach. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that through the power of the Spirit, that you would open our eyes, open our hearts, open our ears to the message that you would have for us today. We, I just declare that you are worthy of our worship. You alone are worthy of our worship, and so we offer it to you. And I pray, Father, that uh, as people are out there struggling with different things, um, that you would demonstrate your faithfulness to them, that you would demonstrate your power, and that uh, people would understand uh, your glory. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunities that you provide to serve you. And I pray that you would help us to see new ways of serving you, and ways maybe that we hadn't considered before. Help us to be a light to those around us. Help us, Lord, to be filled with your spirit and to submit to you more and more each day. Just pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, enjoy this song. I love you. For your mercy never fails me. Oh, my days. I've been held in your hand. From the moment that
All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's chapel. I hope that you're all doing well. I know Mark wished you well, but I got to do it too. Um, but I'm so excited to kind of finish out the rest of chapter one. Um, Hannah's story is one that has really, really been on my heart lately. And um, I mean, you're probably thinking, yeah, I know you're the one leading us through it, but it's something that just kind of hit me hard, you know, about a month ago at the start of one of our chapels. I um, I said, oh, the Lord put this verse on my heart from chapter 16, which I actually get to teach on, but um, this is something else that kind of came up about two weeks later as I was kind of starting to get ready to look at all of these. You know, this story was just something that God put on my heart, and I want to share with you the words of Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, because I think as we look at this book, as we continue to open it up and we start working our way through it, the words of this psalm really go along with the theme of this book and what I, the theme from yesterday of, you know, what is your king? What in your life can you not live without? Or what, what gives you significance and meaning and security? In the words of this psalm, you know, when we really think about that question, this is, this is I guess, how we could pray it back to the Lord. It says this, it says, search me, O God and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And, you know, I share that not just as an encouragement, but, you know, I truly believe the more we know ourselves, the more we can not just know the depths of our sin, but the depths of God's grace. And, you know, on top of that, we can see all the ways that God has just poured his grace and his mercy into our lives. So um, as we kind of open up, maybe um, maybe that's um, just a way to encourage you is, is as we are looking through this book, ask, ask yourself that question, Lord, what is, what is the king of my life? Are you the king of my life? Have I given everything to you? Um, and and maybe if, if you're like, I don't know, I don't even know how to ask that, well, maybe just use those words from Psalm 139. Um, but I always like to start, start with a short story, and um, that kind of relates to something in the passage. And this one's not going to be a very strong one. It's a weak one, but, you know, um, that's just how it is sometimes. And a couple years ago, I think it's two years now, my parents um, built a house, and um, they live like 10 hours away from me. So, um that's why I, I don't really get to go home a lot, but uh, I, I just don't know if it was last year or two years, to be honest. This feels like this whole last year has been a fog. But um, anyways, they built in, they built a new house. And whenever they moved in from their old house, that's the only house that I'd ever known in my whole life, in my childhood home. And so you can imagine, you know, I lived in that town for 21 years. I went to college in the same town. And all the stuff that you can accumulate in that. And my parents lived in there longer than the 21 years I lived there. So all the random things that they had in their attic or in the back of closets that you just forget that you even have. And um, they had kind of set all my stuff to the side. And they were like, Josh, next time you're home, we want you to go through this. And then we'll just get rid of whatever you don't want. And there was this, you know, you, you look at all the like old like original PlayStation games and things like that, that you're like, oh man, I wanted that so bad. Now I don't even remember owning it. You know, you're you just all types of stuff like that. But one of them was my Letterman jacket from high school. And if you don't know what a Letterman jacket is, it's kind of like a a wearable trophy case. Um, <laughs> it's like it's got all your accomplishments on it. So it's got you know badges with like. Um, mine had like soccer and football stuff like American football and um, you know all the times we'd been to the playoffs um, awards things like that how many times that I actually lettered and I just whenever I was little I just thought those jackets were the coolest things because you always saw the high school kids driving around in their cars you're like oh, I want to drive when I grow up and you're like Okay, and all oh, those jackets are so cool look how much school pride they have but the funny thing is whenever I got in high school I never even wore it, and, you know, that jacket hasn't seen the light of the sun in 14 years. Uh, you know, since I was uh, 15 or 16, that jacket has never really been worn. It just kind of got badges stuck on it because my mom's an awesome mom. And, you know, I told you it wasn't a great analogy, but 
how that Leatherman jacket, how I always wanted it when I was little, is kind of how we saw Samuel was for Hannah. Hannah always wanted to have a child because in her culture, her self-worth, all of those things, all her future, her, you know, that's the child, children are your retirement plan. They're they're the line of your family. Who are you going to give your stuff to if you don't have children to give it to? Um, and so Samuel is her letterman jacket. That's that's how we're going to open up. And um, and what we're going to do is we're going to pick up in verse nineteen and we're going to read through the rest. So um, verse nineteen through twenty eight and. <clears throat> If you remember back to yesterday before we read, verse 9 was kind of the key to the first chapter. Because what does it say? It says that um, that she arose and she's, her mindset changed. And we're, we're kind of today kind of get to see her, her mindset fleshed out. Because she arose. She said, God, I'm no longer going to start putting my self-worth in other things besides you. I'm no longer going to find my security in other things besides you. I'm going to worship you. And so... She came to that decision first, then she left and her face was happy. Um, and so, you know, like today, I no longer <laughs> find my value in my uh, my letterman, but uh, that that's kind of how how I hope that we go forward in this book. And so let's let's look at it. It says this. I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation in verse 19. It says this. The entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more. And then they returned home to Ramah. When Elkanah slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her plea. And in due time, she gave birth to a son named Samuel. There's our guy. Uh, he is one-third of, of this book. Like Remember when we look back to the structure. So, very important person. And I asked the Lord for him. This is what she said. And the next year, Elkanah and his family went on their annual trip to offer a sacrifice to the Lord to keep his vow. But Hannah did not go. She told her husband, wait until the boy is weaned, and then I will take him to the tabernacle, leave him there with the Lord permanently. Whatever you think is best, Elkanah agreed. Stay here for now, and may the Lord help you keep your promise. So she stayed home and nursed the boy until he was weaned. And when the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle of Sheol, and they brought along a three-year-old bull for the sacrifice and a basket of flour and some wine. After sacrificing the bull, they brought the boy to Eli. Sir, do you remember me? Hannah asked. I'm the very woman who stood here several years ago, praying to the Lord, and I asked the Lord to give me this boy. And he has granted my request. Now I'm giving you, or I'm giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And they worshipped the Lord there. So what I want to do, I kind of want to just walk through these verses and um, just kind of work our way through them. And then I want to leave you with what I think are the four main points of of ch all of chapter one, and the the four main points of Hannah. And I'm sure Richard tomorrow, as he looks at the prayer of Hannah, will bring some of this out. But um, I don't want to step on his toes too much. But I, <laughs> I want to I want to leave us with those four lessons. So um, like, if we go back and we look at verses 19 and 20, what do we see? We see Samuel's birth. Um, Hannah could genuinely worship God here. Um, worship the Lord in faith, even though the promise was not fulfilled. And I think that's one of the hardest things to do. And 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 we because we want things and we want them now, especially if you're an American. Um, you know, it's kind of like I don't know if you saw the show Rugrats, but I remember them always saying, "We want it and we want it now." Um, but what is what does it say? It says that God remembered her. God remembered her and it's not that God could forget I mean God operates outside of time and he's perfect and he's omnipotent and you know all powerful all of these things it's not like God forgot her but this is putting into like human words and it's called anthropomor anth anthropomorphism sorry um, where, where it takes on like human characteristics of God to try to explain something so God <clears throat> 
when it says that God remembered her, it's not that he forgot her, that he didn't want to bless her, that he was trying to get her to get enough faith to make this happen. No, it's just in the process of time it happened the right way. And I think that's the hardest thing for us to do sometimes is wait on the time of God. Because at the end of the day, if God is a perfect being, if God's a holy God, then his timing and his will is perfect and all sufficient. And whenever we can get out of our own way and operate inside of that, we can have that same joy that she has. And, you know, whenever we get outside of that, what happens to us? We get bitter. We get impatient. And, The thing is, God remembered her, and he blessed her faithfulness. So I think there's a challenge right there. And then in verses 21 through 23, we see God's blessing. You know, that Hannah waited until Samuel was weaned. And in that culture, that could have been two or three years. And, you know, yesterday we talked a little bit about how when Hannah – was praying to the Lord. She said, I'm going to give him to you. This is your child. I, and, and this is a way of God blessing her because her hope for the future, all of those things, she still gave it away. She still put all of those things in the hands of God. But God allows her to have some time with this child to get the blessing of being a mother. I don't have children, but I have a niece. And she is about a year and a half old. And when she smiles at me, I can't tell you how good that feels. Like, uh, whenever I, I will, like, video chat my little brother and, and his wife, Jesse, and I'm like, hey, guys, how are y'all doing? And they're, they're like, we're doing good. And they're like, are you calling to speak to Sadie? I'm like, of course I am. Who wants to talk to you guys? And, uh, you know, I just get that phone, and I see her little face, and it just lights up my heart. Well, God allowed that to happen for Hannah, to have two or three years where she could you know, start off that relationship and have that blessing of that child, that joy. And then she dedicates him to the Lord. And and what I think is so great here, we see such a positive view of Elkanah. In the beginning, remember that uh, he had, he had um, kind of fallen short yesterday. I said, you know, he kind of acts like a dad in a sitcom, an American sitcom. He just kind of comes up short. He's like, why are you always so sad? I I give you a double portion of food, like two scoops of ice cream can help everything. But um, today he gets it right. And he says, do everything in obedience to God so that we may see his word established in us. And that's awesome. Like what great leadership right there, you know? Hey, we dedicated this child. This was a decision that we made together. We got to follow through. Why? Not not so God won't curse us or something, but so that God's word could be established in us, so that we remain faithful to him, so that we can worship him in spirit and truth. That's awesome. And so they dedicate Samuel. And he does <clears throat> he doesn't just become a blessing for Elkanah and and Hannah. No, God would take this baby, and we're gonna see that he becomes the judge. He could becomes the last judge. And through him, he becomes, you know, we, we're still talking about his story today. So he is a blessing to the whole world and past his time and years and years and years and years and years later. What a blessing of God. And then in verses 24 through 28, <clears throat> we get to see this. We get to see how to worship. And I say that because of the words. Um, I also have lent him to the word. That's the way that um, one Bible translation um, says that Hannah says it. But it can also be translated this way. And I also made myself a present for the Lord. Because I think the idea is that Hannah already knew from the beginning she didn't own Samuel. But Samuel was God's and God's to do with. So she had him. For a short time she understood that she knew that even though he was all she ever wanted and all she had ever really had ultimately Samuel was God I think that's a lesson that maybe you know I like I said I don't have kids but maybe that's a lesson that parents need to hear today is that you know your kids are it's great that they're your kids but you have to release them to God and his will too 
because ultimately, if if we put our faith and hope in Jesus Christ, we're God's. And yes, we have a responsibility to our family. They're they're a very important thing, a responsibility to our friends. But ultimately, our true purpose is God's will. And so maybe, you know, you're in a spot where you're like, man, maybe I'm holding my kids back. Or, you know, maybe my parents are holding me back and I just need to step out in faith and say, Lord, I'm yours. I feel like you're calling me to this and I need to do it. But that's a rabbit trail and I don't, I don't want to go down it too, too long. Um, so this is how, though, whenever we look at it, that we're to give ourselves to God, realizing that we may want many things, we may have desires, but God's will is the most important thing for us to strive after in our whole life. And so as we kind of look there, what are, um, what are things that we learn? What are those four lessons that I said, you know, that we can take away from Hannah? And I think the first one is this, and these will be really short. The first one is this, is that most of our hurt and disappointment comes from seeking another king besides God. Remember yesterday, Hannah had to get to that verse 9. She had to get to the point where she rose and said, no longer will this define me. No longer will this desire be the number one thing in my life. No longer will I look to my career, my wife, my, my husband, my kids, my anything. God, I'm not putting anything before you. You know, because really when we think about it, whenever we look at our lives and we look at the things where we're most disappointed, we look at things that where we're most hurt, most worried, most stressed. All of these words, all these words have like such negative things, right? And it's, it feels kind of like, man, if I could chase the smoke that's coming from those fires, what will we see? That these things are the signals of areas that we haven't given to God. And so that, that's the first thing, that the most, most of our hurt, most of our dis, disappointment comes from seeking another king besides God. The second thing is this, that God is better than many sons in this, or a king, just to keep going with that analogy, but um, God is better than many sons. Remember, Elkanah had two wives, right? Not only that, which one did he like more? The one with no wives, or no, <laughs> no kids, sorry. But Hannah's story is not a way of telling you how to get all that you ever wanted. It's not a story of telling you hey, if you just make a treaty with God, he's going to give it to you because you may never get those things. And uh, you may live for your whole life and never never even think about touching them, even if they're good things. But the point is to show you that you can have God and that God is enough. You know, that's the one thing that Hannah didn't truly have. Yeah, she had gone there and worshipped before, but it wasn't out of her whole being and I think sometimes that's what we do we kind of flirt with God in a way with our hearts and we say God do we we want your blessings but we don't want all of you and that's crazy if you really think about it that's absolutely insane to look at the God that is all-powerful that that we know died on a cross for our sins and say hey I know you gave up everything for me but I can't give all of me to you even though you've promised only good things, only to pour out your mercy and grace. And yes, I'll have to face things in this world that I don't want to, but you said you're going to be there right beside me. That's crazy. But the point, <clears throat> also, you know, the one who has, God has everything. That's what I'm trying to say. So, And everything in abundance. Why? Because success is not based on the panaz of our life. You know, that's the other wife. What does she constantly tell Hannah? She's, or maybe we just look at her and say the world, you know, telling you that all the things you don't have are what really give you what you need. It's about knowing the all-loving, all-powerful God that has you in his hands and promises to take care of you. So that's the second thing. The third thing is this, and this is something that I think um, might be the biggest point for me um, that hit me the hardest over the last few weeks is this, is that barrenness does not mean God forsakenness. And how do I know this? Because Christ became barren for us. Like I said a second ago, Christ died on the cross for our sins. He took 
all of our sin upon himself, became our substitute, our substitute atonement, because he was perfect and blameless. Christ is the ultimate king, and he's sitting on the throne in heaven, reigning today. So when you accept him in your heart, you get his approval. When God looks at you, he doesn't see your mistakes. He sees Christ's blood covering you. He was our sacrifice, and he loves us for who we are, all that we are, all that we have done, and all that we will ever do. And so that's what I want you to see is that barrenness does not mean God forsaken us. And this is the fourth and final thing right here, that God loves people the world cast away. Hannah was worthless to the world. Women in that day, they, like we've said, and we've kind of beat this dead horse, but they didn't really, they weren't much more than property. They were there to, uh, to give you sons and to run your household. And she couldn't even do that. She had no hope for the future. But God would do everything to get her. And so in that culture where she's pretty much worthless, God saw her in her desperation. Praying so hard, if you remember, the sons of Eli were like, this woman's drunk in the morning. Why is she even here? And she was so distressed that that they thought that she was drunk. But God remembered. And so this morning, I want you to take that to heart. That God remembered that one phrase. Maybe, maybe just take that through the rest of your day. That God hears our prayers and he actually cares. So lay whatever king that you have in your life that you've put over Christ. Put it down at his feet and let Jesus be on the throne of your life. Because I promise you this, as, as hard as it is to lay it down, God, Jesus Christ, will give you grace. He will give you the ability to lay it down. And He will meet you where you are and walk you through whatever that is in your life. So, I hope that gives you a word of encouragement this morning. I hope that it um, gives you a sense of peace. Because I know for me, to, to think that through those four points, you know, that most of our hurt and disappointment comes from seeking another king or that God is better than many sons that barrenness does not mean God forsakenness and that God loves the world or God loves people that the world cast away those points are something I kind of constantly have to tell myself because I don't want to believe it I don't want to believe God is that good but he is so I challenge you with that this morning I encourage you with that this morning go to him in prayer lay your life down and I promise he will pick you up Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being here. I look forward to hearing Richard um, open up chapter two tomorrow. And uh, we will see you same time, same channel.